Welcome back to another episode of Data Science at Home podcast. We are on YouTube, so please subscribe to our new channel, uh, youtube.com uh, at data science at home. But of course, we'll report also the link in the show notes of each episode uh, on the official website, data science at home.com. So thank you very much for following us. And uh, in uh, this episode, I would definitely like to speak about something that everyone, really everyone is affected by. Uh, which is the energy consumption of large language models and new generation AI, as you know, many people misunderstand. As I already said many other times in, on this show, large language models are just one of the many possible ways to uh, build artificial intelligence systems. Uh, and uh, mm, of course, they perform pretty well in several sectors, especially when they have to deal with text and uh, mixing and matching, uh, actually more mixing than matching um, capabilities and uh, uh, text coming from different domains. And of course, there are, um, you know, multimodal uh, models that is, uh, you know, models that can uh, manipulate different data types. But this doesn't matter in the sense of energy efficiency. They all are uh, quite inefficient when it comes to the energy consumption that this mo- or the energy that these models uh, usually require. And uh, so it would be nice to share some of the findings that uh, um, you know I found on the internet, which is always a very nice source <laughs> that make, should make people aware of what's going on. And uh, I want to share this, that uh, that I found this kind of summary statistics that I found on uh, uh, bestbrokers.com. And of course, I will uh, report everything in the show notes of the episode and uh, in the down links here uh, on, uh, on YouTube, if you're watching it from YouTube. Um, so there are some numbers that are really, uh, really interesting uh, and quite scary, I should say, <laughs> um, because, um, you know, if you look at, uh, uh, you know, chat GPT energy consumption uh, for responding to prompts and costs in only in the US, OK, only in the in the States. Now, I speak about chat GPT because it's the one that everybody knows and probably majority of us are using. But in fact, uh, it's not only chat GPT or, you know, open AI that is affected by this uh, energy inefficiency. Pretty much all models, even the ones that actually, uh, you know, open source or that you can, you know, you decide to uh, to run on your own servers or, or at home if you have a powerful enough machine. Uh, I'm not saying that, the, of course, they don't have to serve millions or billions of queries. Uh, but if you count per query, you know, the costs per query can be very comparable. Now, if you look at chat GPT energy consumption in the time period of a day, uh, there are something like, you know, uh, 428 million prompts all over the world. Well, in, in fact, it is only the US uh, in 24 hours, which means um, 1.2 million kilowatt hour, which is an incredible amount, and uh, something like 172, $162,000 per day, only energy. Then you need infrastructure, you need to pay the people, researchers, etc. So imagine the, the value and the money uh, that these models can burn. Uh, on a week, uh, <laughs> you have something like three, is that a billion? Yeah, you have three billion prompts and you have already uh, 1.1 million uh, dollars uh, per week. And you know, if you you know start scaling to the month or to the year, you get to the almost 60 million dollars per year, which is an incredible amount. Now, there is, there are yet other numbers. For example, I would like to share this with you as well, which is still from the same uh, uh, from the same article. This is the annual amount of electricity that ChatGPT uses to respond to prompts, uh, which is some which sums to about uh, 453 million kilowatt hour. Uh, what can you do with this amount of energy? Well, you can charge every electric vehicle in the U.S. two times. Uh, can you believe that like every electric vehicle in the US for twice uh, or you can power 43,000 households for a year that's the amount of energy that you build uh, that you that you burn uh, just to respond to prompts um, or you can charge almost 96 million iPhones daily for 365 uh, 65 days for one year um, you know free charge uh, for the entire day um, or uh, supply electricity to uh, a country like Austria 
for two days and a half. I don't know why they they chose Ultra probably because it was it was definitely the most uh, the closest uh, the closest numbers. But there are probably several other countries that you can power with that amount of energy. Um, I mean, it's something unbelievably uh, huge. Now, if I want to read even more uh, important statistics, well, not so important, it's like to put things in perspective, like each query to ChatGPT uses something like 0 0.0029 kilowatt hours of energy. And that is something like 10 times what a Google search requires, right? One Google search query versus 10. Um, so, you know, it means that one, uh, sorry, one of the ChatGPT um, query means, uh, uses the same energy as 10 uh, Google requests, which means that if you have 1 billion queries uh, on ChatGPT, that would mean 10 billion queries equivalent uh, in Google, which is incredible. It's an incredible amount of, of energy. And when I said this is, does not affect ChatGPT like OpenAI only, this affects pretty much you know, it's the nature of the model that is uh, indeed a very heavy and very power hungry. Um, so don't expect that if you have, you know, a, a model at home, you would burn less. Of course, it would burn less just because you have much less parameters there. Um, probably you will not have like 100 and plus billion uh, or 200 billion uh, parameters. Uh, you probably would not have the hardware to run that thing to execute that query at all. Uh, but you would definitely run, for example, I've seen some of my friends are even running a 40 billion parameter model. They have really beefy machines, definitely beefier than mine. Uh, but I could do a decent job um, fine tuning and in, you know running in inference mode a, a 7 and a 13 billion uh, parameter model, which is already quite intensive for, uh, for my machines and quite a bit for my uh, electricity bill. <laughs> so I did it a few times and, you know, I, tr I will try to avoid that because especially here in Europe, electricity is not free of charge. <laughs> um, now, with this, what I want to say is that um, GPT models are a monster. The way these models have been designed, um, you know, it's not, it's definitely not uh, power efficient. Um, and, you know, this uh, uh, never-ending growth towards, uh, you know, bigger and bigger models uh, doesn't seem to, you know, slow down uh, or, you know, nobody's, it seems like nobody's really paying attention to that much to how can we save energy? How can we build more efficient models uh, in the near future? And I say in the near future because I don't want to fall in the same uh, trap of, for example, we have seen this with blockchain technology, um, there is an analogy there that I found, you know, on a personal level. You know, these are two technologies that both involve massive computing power. Um, think about, you know, the GPUs people were using with blockchain technology um, to mine transactions or to mine blocks. Um, but of course, you know, the analogy is on the energy efficiency. Um, that's where is the same, you know, it's the same is happening. And there have been attempts from a blockchain, uh, from blockchain, blockchain community, for example, to mitigate the problem of energy consumption or minimize it as much as they could. Um, and the idea there was to, you know, change the protocols, uh, which means that, you know, for those who are familiar with blockchain technology, was okay. Let's get rid of uh, proof of work. Uh, that is basically solving uh, crypto puzzles, uh, and you know, just burn CPU cycles. Uh, to break that uh, difficult problem, right? Computationally difficult problem. With artificial intelligence and with in particular large language models, we kind of uh, are in the same analogy, which is like, okay, let's try to simplify the model, uh, which means losing a bit of a, you know, accuracy. Think about quantization. Uh, and the same happened in blockchain when people said, okay, let's remove uh, proof of work and... Uh, uh, let's start doing things with the proof of authority, uh, which actually, you know, did not work. In fact, there are even papers that claim that proof of authority is a scam. <laughs> it will never work because that would mean re-centralizing everything. But of course, I don't want to enter the technical discussion of what how blockchain tried to solve the problem of energy. They didn't. 
and that's why the transactions per seconds are still the same the energy consumptions are still the same you know per capita and so nothing changed with respect to 10 years ago there have been some minor optimizations now this is something that we definitely do not want to see for uh, artificial intelligence uh, the analogy is there because technology uh, b strong or powerful technology usually means or has to mean more energy consumption but i want to you know i want the community to break that uh, that connection uh, i strongly believe that uh, powerful technology should be decoupled from the concept of energy consumption um, and there are many you know ways that this can be done uh, i will mention only three in this episode of course uh, probably food for thought and uh, some of them are actually uh, you know things that researchers and community uh, are taking uh, are pretty much aware of um, for example efficiency focused algorithms um, you know in which um, of course uh, um, you know researchers are thinking about more efficient ways to uh, for example run uh, large language models in uh, in inference mode uh, then there is hardware optimization and finally there is uh, uh, decentralized learning which is a very important and actually very fun way of you know training or fine tuning large language models now the very first thing about um, um, efficiency focused algorithms we have seen several approaches here um, that um, researchers are already taking into account we have seen and we have also uh, covered on this show uh, the concept of pruning and quantization techniques these are all techniques for example model pruning and weight quantization that reduce the size of the large language model and definitely reduce the complexity uh, of neural networks overall because the floating point operations that need to be done by the actual cpu or gpu um, you know in a quantized way they are um, less heavy uh, I'm trying to simplify for the non-technical people in the show, <laughs> try to understand how uh, is it possible to have, for example, something faster and smaller uh, with the 4 bits rather than 64. Well, 4 bits means less bits to represent a number, and all the operations that you do, more or less all operations that you do on that number, if that number can be represented with a smaller number of bits, of course, also the operations that you are performing on that number will be uh, let's say smaller or more efficient uh, but of course smaller means less accuracy because uh, instead of representing a number like 1.234567 and another 100 uh, digits you would you know cut uh, the precision because you know when you quantize you are in fact reducing the precision of the number of the number representation and of course of the operation that you are performing on that number um, Many other researchers have been thinking of uh, sparsity, increasing the sparsity in neural networks. And so they have realized and uh, actually measured uh, with performance benchmarks that sparse models uh, are more efficient, are more energy efficient, where most of the network, or many, uh, of the network connections are zeroed out, um, you know, because they do not participate, let's say, to the final result. Um, and so they can, in fact, reduce the number of connections and reducing the number of connections in turn means that all the operations that you are doing, you are performing on the connections of the network are also simpler and therefore they need less power to, uh, to calculate. Uh, and finally, there is self-supervised learning, uh, reducing the need for uh, extensive label data and resources can, always, can also lower the cost associated with, for example, data curation and, of course, processing, directly reducing the energy footprint of these AI systems. The second um, school of thought, let's say, or, or approach to minimize or mitigate the problem of uh, energy consumption comes from hardware optimization. And this is something that, you know, researchers and especially software developers Unfortunately, they cannot control uh, that much because this is more the task of uh, hardware manufacturers. Um, we have seen this a number of times in the history of computing uh, with ASICs and TPUs very recently. Companies like Google uh, already have developed AI-specific processors. Um, TPU stands for a Tensor Processing Unit um, that are highly efficient um, for specific operations in machine learning. Okay, And so... Uh, the tensor processor is something that, of course, is not yet, you know, off the shelf, even though you can purchase 
pretty easily a, a TPU. Um, but it's not something that, uh, you know, um, everybody is considering, especially um, server side. Um, another thing is still in the field of hardware optimization is so-called low power edge devices. And uh, these are uh, specialized edge devices and microcontrollers, for example, NVIDIA Jetson Nano or uh, um, Coral's Edge TPU. Uh, these are bringing powerful AI processing to small, low-power devices for usually local processing, what we call uh, processing on the edge, right? And, uh, and this dramatically reduces the uh, energy consumption. Uh, and finally, we have uh, uh, neuromorphic chips. This is a, a very interesting one because it's like, it's first of all an emerging technology, even though it's several years that people are talking about this. And this is truly inspired by the human brain, um, even more than deep learning itself, <laughs> because it simulates neural activity with lower energy demands. And um, uh, the, the reason I say that it mimics um, the human brain even more than deep learning is because it also mimics the fact that the human brain doesn't necessarily mean, uh, doesn't necessarily require um, an, um, an enormous amount of energy, right? Uh, our brain is limited to a certain power. I don't remember by heart what's the consumption of our brain on average, depends on many factors, but our brain cannot absorb, let's say, more watts than uh, a certain threshold, because otherwise our head would overheat and probably explode. <laughs> so since nature uh, didn't want that, uh, our brain is, uh, you know, uh, as evolved to function at particular frequencies and at particular uh, levels of energy consumption without uh, you know, going over over uh, such thresholds. And so neuromorphic chips or neuromorphic compute, uh, in fact, mimics also this part of the brain, which in my opinion is very interesting because it's probably the one we are, you know, interested the most because, um, you know, if you can have more or less the same reliability, I'm not saying of a human brain, but of a biological brain, maybe of an organism, um, thinking about energy and the how much energy you need in order to uh, match that particular capability or match that particular reliability, uh, that's a very interesting metric that I would definitely consider as a researcher in the future. The other um, school of thought or other approach that uh, definitely interests the work of software developers is decentralized learning. And um, there have been already attempts, uh, even in uh, during the blockchain period, um, for some kind of analogy or coincidence, whatever. Uh, we know federated learning, for example, um, which is a distributed learning approach that trains uh, machine learning models back in the days, but now also large language models on edge devices, so on, uh, you know, physical device in the field, as people say, allowing data to stay local. And so reducing the need for extensive data transfers between my, let's say, mobile phone or whatever device to a central server. So if I can save energy because I don't need to send the data to the central location, to the central server, I can process it on the edge, I can process it on my device. Well, that's already a big part of the process that you uh, can spare and definitely can save energy there. Then we have uh, edge computing with local inference. This is another approach. Uh, moving AI computations to edge devices means that uh, models perform tasks on the user device rather than in centralized server. Uh, and this approach uses local resources, again, lowering the cost and energy required for data transmission. Now, of course, this means that, you know, many of the capabilities that you can perform when the compute unit is in the centralized server. You know, central servers can have, let's say, quote-unquote, infinite energy, infinite compute power, or whatever, they, you know, the provider can afford. While on the edge, you might have probably, you know, battery limitations. You would have energy limitations because of presence of battery. Um, or simply, you know, the, the device is a tiny device, or think about a mobile phone, even though last generation mobile phones are very powerful, but still, they, they are definitely less powerful than the top 
uh, um, centralized servers and compute engines that you can find you know, in data warehouses. And finally, we have distributed architectures. Uh, this is one of the most interesting ones because uh, some researchers and some you know, folks in the community are already thinking, and there are some uh, interesting frameworks I will uh, uh, review in uh, the next episodes uh, on this show. Uh, it's about peer-to-peer -peer training architectures or grid computing setups that could spread the computation load using only nearby nodes as needed and potentially leveraging idle computing power. So this is kind of an approach between the energy grid and decentralized compute it's uh, you know an hybrid, uh, though I'm personally interested in uh, the fact that you know currently we can train or fine tune large large language models in a decentralized fashion, which means that you can set up a cluster or a global network of nodes, some with your friends if you have for example privacy concerns, or even your own servers uh, scattered around the globe, and uh, um, you know fine tune. Uh, the same model in different areas in different geographic locations that would be something pretty interesting because you would avoid moving the data back and forth and you would just move the compute where the data is these are not absolutely you know novel techniques uh, we have seen this uh, a few years ago they usually go under the name of federated learning or multi-party computation for those who are more familiar with uh, for example the crypto or encryption environment or fields of research, uh, not absolutely new, just adapted to the new needs of the world, which is definitely uh, maintaining the level of reliability of these large language models, which are indeed useful in many sectors, in many domains. But at the same time, we don't want to fall in the trap of uh, extremely high consumption that become and that will make the models absolutely uh, you know, non-scalable and definitely not sustainable. That's it for today. I hope you enjoyed the show and uh, please don't forget to subscribe to the new YouTube channel. It's on uh, youtube.com uh, at datascienceatom.com and I will report everything in the show notes of this episode at the official website datascienceatom.com. Talk to you next time.